I had a mentor, uh, Gordon Lish, an editor, years ago. And one of the things he used to say is never elevate yourself above the other in your work. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and my mother, Caroline Kilborn, was not able to be with us today, but she'll be back with us next week. And we have a really uh, timely, interesting, fascinating book today to discuss. Our guest is Mitchell S. Jackson. Now, Mitchell's acclaimed debut novel, The Residue Years, won the Ernest Gaines Prize for Literary Excellence and was a finalist for a large number of awards, including the Penn Hemingway Award for First Fiction and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. And Jackson has received numerous honors from such places as the Ford Foundation, Penn America, TED, New York Foundation for the Arts, etc. His writing has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, the Paris Review, the Guardian, Tin House, and elsewhere. He is a clinical associate professor of writing in liberal studies at New York University. The title of this book is Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Mitchell. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> now, do you prefer to go by Mitchell or Mitch? Uh, whenever one feels most comfortable to you. If they were my students, I would say Mitchell, but okay, everyone well. else gets to pick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can, I can do Mitchell. I can do Mitchell. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> so, Mitchell, you wrote a novel. I'm guessing, well, you published a novel. Have you written mm-hmm. other novels other than the one that was published? No, that was it. I just I, I stuck <laughs> with that. Uh, for a very long time, 13 years, I worked on that novel. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's not the longest that I've had guests say they worked on a novel, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're, clo- you're, you're, you're close to winning the prize, but not quite. Well, um, what is the prize? What's, what's the longest? <laughs> you know, I think about 20 years. I think I had somebody oh, who'd Lord. worked on it about 20, yeah. 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 So, and now this book, Survival Math, is... Part memoir, part, yeah. uh, what would you say, sociological study of uh, inner city black communities. Okay. Partly history of um, Portland. Yes. And what else? What else can, what else is wrapped in here? Uh, I would, the, I guess the, the most simple way I would describe it is a, is a memoir in essays. Um, and I, I think I make the distinction in my head because I feel like each chapter is uh, has a uh, an idea at the heart of it that's like separate from whatever the preceding or the following uh, chapter is. So I like, but I also think that because all of them are kind of grounded in stories about me or my family, that that's where the the kind of memoir comes in. So I say a memoir and essay is the description I've been using. Though it does include those other elements, you know, history, sociology, psychology a little bit. Right, right. And what drove you to write this book? Uh, so I was looking, um, when Residue came out, the Residue Years, which I just call Residue, uh, the novel came out, it received a fair amount of um, of critical attention. But uh, I remember when I uh, when I was sending it out on submission to agents, no, no, to, sorry, to editors, that uh, one of the quotes, uh, the responses that I got back from an editor that like drove me crazy, was uh, this: uh, I felt that the combination of intellectual references and street slang and Champ's voice came off sounding oddly implausible, as original <laughs> as it is. And uh, that just, I mean, it, 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 it bugged me when I first read it. It bugged me, like, almost all the way through the process of uh, publishing Residue. And I just kept thinking that, wow, this guy can't imagine that a guy could be both, you know, I guess for lack of a better explanation or description, like street smart and uh, literary smart or academic. And uh, I think that this book is a way for me to kind of force a reader to reckon with both of those selves. Mm. It is, 
I think unusual for a lot of um, people who aren't exposed to the type of community that you grew up in yeah. to understand that both of those are there. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And so I think I think it's you're getting the word out. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> now, um, let's talk about the title. Okay. Sur- survival math, which is also the title of one of the essays. Yes. And it has to do with if I if I get this right, you can correct uh-huh. me. Um, sort of the calculations that a young well, maybe not even just young, but um, the calculations that a black man in America today has to go through just to survive. Yeah. Um, I I think, uh, I don't even know if I would limit it to black men. I think it's, it's <laughs> the calculations that people who are placed, uh, that often people who live in disadvantaged communities must uh, compute in order to kind of, either stay alive or to, like, have some sense of security in their life. And with me, it just so happened to kind of come out of uh, a confrontation with a guy that could have, uh, you know, ended up with me being dead. Uh, and, uh, and you know, I, I wasn't actually thinking about it as survival math in, those, in the 20 years ago when it happened or 25 years ago, but I do know that there was, several decisions uh, that I had to make in a, in a very short span of time. So he, he threatened me and, you know, said he was going to, he would kill me. And between him saying that and me responding to him, I don't know how many kind of thoughts went through my head. But later on, when I started composing the book, and this is, again, decades later, I started to ask myself, well, I know that my, a lot of my family members are, are, are living in the same community, and I wondered if, if some of them had similar experiences, or if there were experiences that were different than mine, but that were also that also had something to do with survival. And so I went and asked. Um, I interviewed 16 men in my family, and I asked each of them the same question. And the question was, "What's the toughest thing that you survived?" Uh, and then I uh, took their answers and I wrote them as second-person narratives. Um, I ch- choosing the second person because I thought that it was one way to uh, invite the reader to, to empathize and even to imagine themselves as the protagonist. And then um, I also wanted to give the, the 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 people who I interview like a some some form of anonymity, so I never um, distinguish which story belongs to which person either. Um, so those are all. That's, kind of part of their, they both, the, the photos and the stories make up what's called the survival files in the book. And those are interspersed between the essays. Yes. Right. And so the pictures, then these are all um, relatives of yours? Yes, relatives. All, all of my brothers, um, my uncles, um, cousins, uh, grandfather is even in there. And the, the photos, you know, kind of mostly look sort of like mug shots. Was that intentional? Yeah, well, the, 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 the one thing that I wanted to do was to decontextualize the images. So I should, I should also say that a part of the, the photo, um, the reasoning for the photos was I was responding to, I started thinking about this when, the, like, the, at the kind of inception of the Black Lives Matter movement, when, you know, like, they were saying that some of the people that were killed had looked dangerous or were threatening. Right. And I really right. wanted to see if I could kind of challenge that. Um, and so what I did with the photos is I, I told them to take all of the jewelry off, you know, earrings. I also placed them all in a, they were all wearing the very same thing, which is a black t-shirt. I framed them roughly the same. I shot them in black and white. So I was trying to remove as much context as I could from them to really, uh, invite the reader to question: Did these men look dangerous? And then also to try to match the the the, the stories to the men. So you know, what is it that you see in a particular person that makes you think that they have done these things or had these kind of experiences? Which to me is also um, kind of critiquing our implicit biases. Mm. Um, 
and yeah, they do look like mug shots. There's a uh, they used to have these uh, rogue galleries in the I think it was the 19th like the mid 19th century. They were really famous where they would take mug shots and like basically turn them into art. And so I think that this uh, the cover very much represents like a kind of uh, a ne neo rogue gallery. Though I also want to question this idea of what it means to be a rogue. Um, you know, uh, to be honest, when I first glanced at this, before I looked closely, I thought most of the men looked angry. But uh -huh. as I looked closer, most of them looked sad. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I tried to get them to, to, as much as they could, not emote a particular emotion. Um, I think that's hard for people who aren't trained actors, <laughs> but I, I really wanted them to, you know, not to reveal, to reveal as little as they could yeah. um, in the photo. Yeah. yeah, but your the eyes are always going to, yeah. they're always going to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Mitchell S. Jackson, author of Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family. So you write about some difficult things in here. Yes. And what kind of feedback did you get from your family? Do they feel like you're revealing family secrets? You do try and... Um, provide anonymity to, to people who might want or need it. But yeah. um, but still, there's a lot a lot going on in here. Yeah, well, um, they haven't read it yet, most of them. <laughs> so we, we haven't got to the what did they think part of it yet. Ah. Um, and I'm actually leaving. I'm, I'm here in Wisconsin now, but the next my next stop on my tour is home. So I'm going home to Powell's, to Portland and Powell's ah. Bookstore. And everyone is asking for books, so I guess we shall find out what they think about what I wrote. But I think um, I go into it with not necessarily confidence, but with the, um, I guess, a little bit of the sucker of having, you know, done the best that I could with the information and knowing that I was pretty pure-hearted in what, like, I, I didn't write anything that I was intentionally trying to ha harm someone. And I also think that the people that I wrote the toughest things about are also the people that I have, like, maybe the closest relationships with. So they they understand our relationship outside of my writing, and I would hope that they understand that I have, you know, I, want, I don't want to see them harmed. Uh, but then I also think, you know, like, the tough stuff is the stuff that you need to write about because that's, you know, that's where the conflict is, and that's also where the challenge is to figure out how to write about it. And then, you know, for me, it was like, well, why am I doing this? And I hope that there's um, something to be gained for people who might be experiencing similar circumstances. Well, the person that you were the hardest on was yourself. Well, in one of them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, throughout your, you know, the the secrets that you're revealing are probably, you know, a good portion of them are your own. Um, yeah. And so it's not like you're just um, hanging anybody else out there without you saying I'm I'm out here with you. Yeah. Well, that was um. I had a mentor, uh, Gordon Lish, an editor, like, oh, years yeah. ago. Oh yeah. I, I yeah. know who that is. Uh huh. <laughs> And one of the things he used to say is never elevate yourself above the other in your work. And I think that that is, uh, I know that's a guiding light in, in both in my fiction and in my nonfiction. It's like if you can reveal something about or critique another person, then you also have to be able to turn that same level of critique on yourself in your work. And, uh, and I think that that gives it a kind of fairness um, in the work that I strive for. And, yeah, I can see that. I feel like you're successful at that. Um, but as I, as I was reading it, and the, the part that, um, that I think that you meant to, the, where you're hardest on yourself, is the essay titled The Scale. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
having had a little bit of uh, experience on the other side of that story. Um, okay. <laughs> what I'm wondering is, and what I, now, now admittedly, I, you know, to do this, I do a show once a week, and so I have to read the books pretty quickly. Um, uh -huh. So I may not have gotten everything out of it, but I kept wondering and didn't get an answer to why did you change? How did you change? Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't, uh, I think there are multiple reasons for it. I think one of the kind of the simplest reason is like I got older and my, my, uh, not only did I get older and my kind of values shift with the age, like I just, I don't want to be out running around and, you know, it, it takes a lot of uh, energy <laughs> and it, it, like you just can't keep that up. That's not a, that's not an old man. <laughs> it's game. not sustainable. Maybe we should give yeah. a little context into what the scale is about. <laughs> okay. So the scale is essentially about levels of womanizing. And, yeah. and it really try, it uses a, a criminal profile, the structure of a criminal pro profile to interrogate um, the, kind of the history of womanizers, but then to also situate myself in, in that history and then to question, um, you know, what was the environment that produced that, but also, like, what are the kind of psychological factors that did it? And then it also uh, details the harms that I've caused women um, and so it's, it's really, uh, um, you know, I was thinking this morning about it. And I was like, well, I started that essay in 2011 and, uh, but I, I finished revising it, you know, several months back. And that was really at the, I don't know if it's the apex, well, I guess we'll know years from now, but like what felt like the apex of the me too movement. Mm. And, but then I said, well, it's different though, because, and, and you may, you correct me if you think that I'm wrong, but like. Me Too was about women forcing men to reckon with what they wrought against other women, right? right? But in this case, it was me, Me Too, and myself. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. Yeah. And, and other men, too. I mean, you were, yeah, 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 yeah. You're saying, yeah, it's like, look so, at the harm that um, you're doing. When you ask, you know, how did I change? I think a part of it was was growth, but it's also like there's a. I think the thing, and I don't know if I maybe got this through in the essay, is that this is part of a like community, and it's a community of like-minded thinkers for various reasons. And so, if you're a part of a community and the community's value systems change, then it gives you less reason or maybe even less opportunity to keep up the same behavior and have the same reinforcements. And so when my friends grow older and get married and have children and, and have really good jobs, and you know, there's no, there's not, the, the, the reinforcement for what you're doing and is, is less. And so um, a part of it while you're doing it is that there's currency that you can use with other men. But when you lose that, it's like, well, then you have to ask yourself, like, why am I doing this? Like, is this just something that's inherent in me, or is this a part of my no nurturing or socialization? And I think for myself, I couldn't answer the question of why do it when there was, like, little positive feedback for it. Mm. Um, so those are, I think those are two kind of reasons for how I got to a space outside that. I mean, I guess you could also say that I opened myself up uh, more to vulnerability um, in my relationships, and maybe that's a part of being old, or it could be a part of, Watching my daughter, who will be 18 this year, you know, like I know that she's about to come into these relationships, and I definitely don't want to model something that I don't want her to interact with. Yeah. Now, you you grew up in a in a neighborhood or in a in a community that where what would you say criminal what is considered criminal behavior is was pretty prevalent. Yeah. Um. It's particularly, it seems like, in the generation before you. Yes. And so has it gotten better? Is it is it continuing to improve? Um, 
And, so, and I, you know, I'm, I'm making an assumption that less criminality is an improvement over more criminality. But yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I had this, someone said uh, in, in, some, in an interview, someone was talking about yeah, criminality before, and I was like, well, to a certain degree, the, whether it's criminal or, criminal or not, is in the, it's like the state. Right. 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 So, the, so uh, but one of the things in the, the scale that I talk about is um, the, the, the two types of crimes uh, throughout history are, uh, what is it, mala and se, and then mala prohibitor. So mala and se crimes are crimes that are wrong in and of themselves. So, like, they're like violations of our kind of moral code. And then mala prohibitor cl- crimes are like crimes that are wrong because the state statute. In, in the state statutes in because the state says so. And so when we talk about criminality, I mean, we can talk about crimes that are, like, wrong in and of themselves, and then, but then there are also, you know, crimes that are like, well, they're just, you know, they've been criminalized by right, right. some kind of state. Um, I think my, uh, kind of the, the men that I grew up with were on both sides of that. Like, I, I would argue that, you know, pimping, uh, is a mala and say crime, like to take advantage of a woman, to force her, to coerce her, to go out and do your bidding and to take all of her resources is mala and say. Um, I think if we talk about drug dealing, I think we get into a kind of stickier place because, you know, over the course of American history, certain drugs have been legal and not legal and back legal again. Right. And so then we have to ask ourselves, like, is that, is it wrong in and of itself? I mean, if we looked at just you know, the marijuana, what's happening now all across the country. Like, I know people who did time for marijuana, and now that would not be the case. So is that mala and say or mala prohibita? Well, um, I think that would be mala prohibita. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I grew up with men. I don't think that it's changed uh, mm-hmm. much, if at all, and that is because it's symptomatic of the, the social climate. And so, I mean, I don't think that black people are in any better shape than they were than they were in in the 1970s. Um, I think we might have, you know, we we could say that we have uh, exemplars, but I don't I don't feel I feel like the the communities that were struggling are struggling in the same way that they were struggling two three decades ago, which produces what these men who are willing to engage in behavior that has been criminalized. Now, you know, looking at your family history, first of all, there seemed to be quite a lot of instability um, in the generation before you and maybe before that. But going back to your great-grandparents was very stable. Um, Yeah. And what do you think, you know, how did that get lost? How did that stability get lost? Hmm. How did... uh... I think the stability was lost in the 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 fracturing of the family. Uh, so my great grandparents uh, were married. Um, well, actually, my great grandmother, which I write about, what, died uh, mysteriously, um, and then my great grandfather remarried a woman who I name as Mama Edie. That was her name. And so they stayed married, I don't know, 40 years. Um, and they were the first Jacksons, as my part of the family, that came to uh, Portland. Uh, and she could not have children, so she adopted children, but they had a very stable household. But I guess this also gets back to Mala, Mala Insane and Mala Prohibitor because she was from a family of wealth, and the, and the way that they gained their wealth was in the prohibition. So they were bootleggers. Her parents were bootleggers. <laughs> And then they sent all their kids to college and bought a bunch of land in Alabama. So my grandmother was a person of means. My great-grandmother was a person of means. So when they moved to Portland, they they didn't really have to struggle in that sense. But my grandmother, my mother's mother, died in an altercation with my grandfather. And so that really was the first kind of fracturing Mm. of that family unit. And so from then on out, like none of my... None of none of my grandfather's children have had successful long-term relationships, except maybe I don't even know if my uncle has. Yeah. So so to me, that's where it kind of started on the Jackson side. Now on the Johnson side, my great grandmother, 
I mean, my grandmother, my father's mother, married several men and, and, and you know, never stayed with them and had uh, many different children. So there was also this kind of, we never, the, the, they never had uh, stability in their home. Um, so I think it really starts with the kind of family unit. Right. And, and societal influences, you know, a, a family unit isn't an island unto itself. So, right. Um, there are certainly influences. And even, even, you know, a family of means, a family of, um, that may appear from the outside as stable, you, like your great grands, um, there may have been stuff going on. Right. Behind right. closed doors that, that impacted the, the uh, children from that family. Yeah. I mean, that's always, you never know. You never know. And um, so, Mitchell, why don't you read a little bit from Survival Math so we can get, uh, the listeners can kind of get a feel for your voice. Okay. Uh, if there's a curse word, should I omit it? or? Uh, yes. Or, okay. Yeah, that would All be right. useful. I will do that. Okay. Uh, so I'll read what was the first survival file that I actually composed, um, which is actually the first survival file in the book, and I'll do my best <laughs> not to curse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You're out one night at the weekend hot spot of too many straight shots to count, and therefore the kind of fate that you swear manifold you're funny when you hear a dude you don't know say blood to cap a sentence i didn't know people were still gang banging you say and search the mirror's faces for mirth but don't nobody smile nor laugh and in fact dude smacks you upside your dome as if your joke was his cue in an instant the two of you take to scrapping inside the club while neighborhood dudes whose account could damage your rep bear witness and you best him before being wrenched apart and bounced outside. He paces one way, you pace the other. And in the distance between you lies the tacit truth that the animosity is in no way squashed. The next day, your friend is hosting your brother's moving to New York barbecue fish fry, and you show up hours prior, dump a shoebox carrying your Uzi and 9 millimeter on the living room table and shout to the group of gathered men and God. I heard somebody was looking for me. Well, let them know. I ain't hard to find. Somebody gonna die. In your mid-30s, you'll bust one shot near, but just near your father inside your crib, not to kill him, but to discourage him from discouraging you against prosecuting what might be your last ballistic beef. But on this day, you're in your late 20s, which in this case is plenty old enough to die. You stomp out of the house and slam yourself into your car, driven by your ride to beyond good sense girlfriend. Your brother calls and cautions you against doing something you'll regret and furthermore against returning to the barbecue fish fry. Hours after his call, you flout your disinvitation, which is to say you show up and stalk the yard with a waist tucked 9 millimeter bulging under your T-shirt and a scowl that ain't got no place near nothing festive. You see a dude who witnessed your scuffle the night before, a dude who's a friend of your new foe, and you flash your nine and threaten him into the basement. You lay your pistol in plain view and see. We can scrap right here, right now, you say. Nah, bro, I don't want no problems, he says, and warns your newest arches foe heard word of your whereabouts and is on his way to the barbecue fish fry for action. By now, almost everyone wants you to leave, including the father of the friend who's hosting, and it's the father's wish you decide to heed. Oh, the timing. You stomp out of the yard, peer down the street, and in the distance see your new arch foe among a circle of dudes. You pull the pistol from your waist, and men, women, and God's only begotten son be darned. March into the middle 
of the street. Once, you told a grade school teacher of your plan to become a hitman, and though you haven't considered that career choice in ages, today could be the day that delivers you to the threshold of that young hope. Before you shoot yourself into that fate, a girl you know from high school darts between you and your new foe. She calls your name, pleads, please don't, please. She announces your fast foe is her brother, appeals once more against gunplay, and you pause, seeing an escape out of what a breath before felt foreordained. Mm. Oh, that's your brother, you say? And lower your pistol. The next week, you pull into the parking lot of the grocery store with your daughter in the passenger seat and out of some place unseen, your foe pulls up beside you. Neither hand touches the wheel and you'd bet blood on why they aren't in view and what one holds. Decisions, of which the most fool would be to reach for what's under your seat. Your daughter is a fifth grader, which is to say, in this instance, plenty old enough to die. You curl over her embrace, and when you don't hear a pistol bark, you raise your head, shake it. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Look your faux eye to assassin black eye and mouth. Man, I don't want no problems. It's squash. It's squash. He idles for what could be the rest of your and your firstborn's life. And that was Mitchell S. Jackson reading from Survival Math Notes on an All-American Family. So I'm curious about the survivor files, which there's 16, right, of them in here? And they're all about that length. How long, you know, did you spend, like, hours in conversation with these men to and and to boil it down their story into you know such a succinct powerful story yeah that's uh yeah i did them all you know i don't know if you heard of ten ten house magazine Have you heard I, of this? yeah in fact uh michelle wildgren used to be their editor and i took a course from her once and she's been oh, on okay. the show before yeah i don't know if she's still there or not but Anyway. Uh, well, you know, they're closing. Well, not the magazine. The, is it the magazine? Yeah, the magazine is closing. Oh, um, wow. That's too bad. Yeah. But uh, they have the Tin House, which is a place in downtown Portland. And what I didn't know is that they let writers stay in the Tin House for very cheap. Um, and so one summer I came home and I stayed there for like 12 days. And uh, I actually conducted most of the interviews for the survival files in Tin house. Mm. Um, and so I would just call, I called, you know, my uncles, cousins, and I would just invite them over. I had a, 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 a setup. Um, I shot all of these as Polaroids, um, which, uh, and then I would, you know, sit down and talk to them for an hour or two. And then I would always have follow up. So one thing that the survival files do, um, and it actually started from that file that I, that I guess that was the template for them is that there's always a moment in the file where I look into the past and one moment where I look into the future. So in this particular one, I look into the future where he'll shoot at his father in his house, and then I look into the past where he said once that he wanted to be a hitman. So I was also trying to find moments that I thought contextualized the current, whatever the current moment was. Right. Yes. Yeah, see, now if you hadn't pointed that out, I wouldn't have noticed it. Yeah. But that's a real—it's really interesting to carry that thread through all of these. Yeah. 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 Well, well, that's Gordon. He said, "What you do <laughs> once, you must do twice." <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, so what led you to become a writer? Uh. Um, well, I, <laughs> you must get that question a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm trying to actually. I don't. I'm try, I, I, I try to refine it so I can like. Re, I don't necessarily know if I know, but um. Oh, so I used to journal a lot, especially when my mom was first struggling with her addiction and I didn't have an outlet to talk about it. I wrote in journals, and I only know this because I don't remember doing it because she kept some of those notebooks. 
Um, and so all of this was really me talking about trauma. Um, but I didn't consider myself a writer. I was not a childhood reader. Um, I didn't start, like, reading, really reading until I was already in graduate school for writing. But I, the first novel <laughs> that I remember reading was when I was in prison. Oh. Um, and it, we had like a two, a two shelf, um, bookshelf or yeah, two shelf bookshelf. And, uh, I read a, a few, uh, novels while I was incarcerated. And that's where I thought like, Oh, I'm going to write my life story. One, because people like to, 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 to make that claim in the, while they're locked up that if, if someone wrote their life story, it would be a bestseller. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then also because I was on a, I was on an academic scholarship when I went into prison, and I knew I was going right back to college, and so I wanted to start preparing my faculties for going back and being, you know, forced to think in a different way. And so I thought writing would, would prepare me for school. Um, I, I got out in, in July of 1998, and in September of 1998, I was enrolled back in college. So it was a really quick turnaround. And when you were when you were in prison, was it for something that today you wouldn't have been locked up for? No, it, I would have been locked up for this. Oh, it was for okay. selling crack. So it was oh, uh, okay. a crack and a gun. So yeah, they. Yeah. I don't think they're going to decriminalize that anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> and how? But you were in college. Yeah, I was you in know, college. I like... was studying speech communications. Uh, because, but I was just. I didn't really have a focus. I just I thought I was going to play basketball, and I thought that eventually I would go overseas and play. Uh, and and so school was just something to do that kind of made me not feel like a failure while I was selling drugs. But also, you know, it, it gave me like a reason to get up and and to have something to do and to feel like I was it was purposeful. Do you feel like you were lucky to have broken that cycle of dealing drugs and pimping and so forth and, and um, go to college, or was it something other than luck? Well, you know, the crazy thing is most of the men that I write about, maybe even all of them, uh, at least, and, it's, uh, and I'm talking about like the my forebears, so like my, uh, my uncles, my dad, all of them went to college at some point. Really? Yeah, they were all really bright, yeah. Some of them became preachers. They all like, like real first-rate rhetoricians, uh, you know. So, like in that sense, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of them. Maybe a couple of them graduated, so, but I don't think most of them graduated. But they all went. So they all, for in, in their own way, saw the value of like a formal <laughs> education. So, so you were following tradition, not breaking with it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, maybe I was the first one to, like, go in and graduate. And I was also, like, you know, uh, I, I mean, I was, like, on the honor roll and the dean's list and all that. So so maybe, I don't know if they did that, but, yeah, they all went and they, I would say they were all really smart. I mean, they definitely were witty and, you know, resourceful and, and, and all of those things. But also, I think, um, book smart. You know, I found it interesting, and I uh, don't remember which, which essay it is in. Oh, I think it's the one about the pose, which is about pimping. The yes. p- The sort of uh, pimp to preacher path. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you think, it, it like makes complete sense. Oh, yeah. Because they're just doing the same thing. And, and actually, like corrupt preachers are really just pimps. Yeah. Right? Like they just, they, they, they. They take all of the offering. They go buy their Cadillacs and Rolls Royces and jets and all of that stuff. And they they really are head down and palm up, literally. Yeah, which is what the pose, head down, palm up. Yeah. What, do, what does that mean? So um, it's a a position um, that uh, I mean you're, you're supposed to it's as a as a as a a pimp, when you are dealing with a woman that's working for you, you're supposed to keep your head down and put your hand out. So it's what can she give you, and then also you're never looking at her. So I think it's in one way it's like to kind of ignore the the harm that you're causing, and the other way is like your hand is always out because that is one you need it, but that's also you have to enforce upon her 
that this is the only thing that she should be doing for you is like giving you all of her resources. Um, and so I take that idea and then try to extrapolate and say, well, what other areas of American culture are other people using this same kind of ideology? You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Mitchell S. Jackson, author of Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family. One thing that surprised me in that, I believe it was in that chapter where you're talking about um, your aunt who became a sex worker by her own insistence. Yeah. Is that a common thing? Do you think that because, you know, there's the whole idea of trafficking and and how wrong that is. But then if if a woman chooses that work. Right. Is that wrong? Is that what what, it's it's confusing that, you know, I didn't even until I started doing the research, like I didn't know that she was so insistent upon that. Um, And I don't I mean, I. I mean, it, it does make it really hard to find the like the the the, uh, the pure fault in that kind of relationship. Um, at least the way I mean. But again, you know, she's passed, so I'm only getting his side of the story. But right. um, I remember uh, I just read recently, um, recently meaning in, I guess the last few months there was someone who posted something on Facebook a, a guy that I know who's like I don't know if he's a former pimp or he's a current pimp but he at some point was involved in life and then the woman some uh, it was a woman that posted and the way that she spoke I mean it was clear that she had been a sex worker but she spoke about it as if like in the same way that my aunt did was like, you know, I don't know why people are disparaging this and like, this is what I do and I have this set of rules. And I was like, wow, like that was so interesting to me. It wasn't like she was portraying herself as a victim. She was actually like, like proud of it almost. And so I guess that, that has to be like the most kind of rare uh, circumstance. I would think most women, but even then it's like, what are the forces that made her believe that that was an option in her life? What kind of kind of moral um, uh, milieu is she in that like she can make that okay in her in her world? So so even if she's saying like this is what I want to do and you you know I'm gonna do it anyway, like I think we would have to take a longer look at that and say like well what are the forces that make that make this an option in a person's life. Well, so, it's, I think that, to some extent, other opportunities being very limited. Right. Yeah. 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 So then, it, then, it's, then, it, then, I, then I, I guess the, the the other point is like, well, then it's not really an option for anyone. Right. Right. If that's your only option, then it's not an option. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, some of the other things that I found really fascinating, you're writing in one chapter about um, how the gang started. And I guess that's survival math. It's in that chapter. And mm-hmm. there was a sentence in here. You're, you're kind of comparing the gangs to, um, Nation. to na- nations and to nationalism. And, of course, that's one of the reasons why this book is so timely because of the rise in nationalism both here mm-hmm. in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, and you you write this one sentence that really just struck me. It said, members of a nation, I'll call them nationalists, love mm-hmm. in proportion to the sacrifices that they've committed and the troubles suffered. And yeah. the reason that jumped out at me is because, um, you know, I'm not afraid to say that I think Trump is an abomination and what's happening in our country is horrible and I don't and it's so hard to understand these people who are so harmed by his policies yeah. and yet support him and this is an explanation for that yeah yeah it's just like shared suffering uh, coheres a nation more than their shared triumphs but that wasn't I mean I think I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing there, but I, I do agree with that, right? So, th- so the more that he can paint them as being victimized by some aspect of American culture, the more it's unifying them, and the more that we kind of, you know, 
can't understand them and 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 count us and other them right as a yeah, thinker yes, outside yeah. of what you know the, the 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 mainstream the more that they unify so it's like it's like it's like uh fighting a monster that you can't win because the more that you're like or the more you call them a monster the the stronger the monster becomes <laughs> yeah yeah and you keep thinking, well, they've got to wake up and see that, that they're yeah. being victimized by the same forces that they're following. How, yeah. You know, when, it, when are they going to see that? And that the people that they, that they demonize are the ones that are trying to help them. Yeah. It's... But, you know, there's um, in the essay, oh, man, which one is it? Uh, it might be, I think it might be Metro, mm, man. I don't remember actually which essay it is, but there is um, every, it might be in Survival Man, but it's like every country has a, every nation has a sacrifice, right? And so, you know, so, so, so these kind of marginalized groups become the sacrifice for the nation to prosper. Um, and I think there's also something to be said about, and maybe that, I think that's in American blood actually. But I think that that is, like, if you can convince someone that, like, you love the state so much that your uh, lack of prosperity is actually a sacrifice that the nation that the, that the nation demands, then you can make it like, uh, like, a, 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 like a, something for them to be proud of as well. Right, and it does sometimes seem like people who are, who get less out of the system that we have are the most patriotic. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, puzzle is puzzling, but is also understandable because of what you just said. Yeah. All right. We're, we're getting short on time. So I have a couple other things I want to get to. Um, okay. Another way this book is really timely is, the current attention being paid to the idea of reparations. Uh -huh. And you do get into a little bit, there's not a lot of it, but a little bit into um, what happened, you know, how, when the slaves were freed. And, oh, yeah. And how, um, what a deep hole they were starting, the freed slaves or former slaves or what is it? People who had been enslaved rather than identifying yeah. them as – rather than slavery being part of their identity being something right. that happened to them. Um, what a deep, deep hole they were starting out in and how how that still has an impact today. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, – in, in that essay, I was trying to figure out – I was really kind of thinking about my father, my stepfather, my uncles, and, like, who were lifetime hustlers. Um, and then, like, well, where did this come from that they felt like this was a necessity for them? And so I was trying to track the genesis of the hustler as I knew it. And it, it, it just, at some point, it just dawned on me that, like, there would have been no need for hustling when they were enslaved. And that... So that meant that hustling, as I knew it, had to have been born after manumission. And so it was really me kind of tracking, you know, what did manumitting the slaves do? And, you know, there's a famous uh, Frederick Douglass uh, speech where he's saying, like, well, yeah, they freed them, but they freed them to famine and to suffer and to, you know, all of those things. Like, all you really got was, like, a certain uh, ostensible freedom while everything else, was you were still enslaved. And so um, one of the things I think in the book that maybe kind of breaks it down as conventional memoir as well is that I imagine whole scenes. So, like, I imagine one slave coming out of uh, – or uh, an enslaved person being manumitted, right? So I didn't mm -hmm. have – I could not find the first, the first person to start hustling, so I had to invent that. I do the same thing with, like, imagining Frederick Douglass making – a, uh, a reprisal of his uh, What to the Slave is a Fourth of July speech. So there are moments where they're like pure fiction in this book. They're, they're few and far between, but, and I also make sure that I, I hope, um, 
prep the reader that th- what follows is is pure imagination. Right, but, right. You know, I couldn't get to some of those things, and I had to figure out, well, how am I going to do this? <laughs> is there a type of writing that you enjoy doing most? Uh, no, I just enjoy sentence making. Mm. So as long as I can make sentences uh, to make sense so I like the freedom to make the kind of sentences I want to make so like I will refuse an opportunity if I feel like the publication will won't accept my uh, voice um, because I, I just I think that to me the voice is who I am and so it's the identity and if you take that away from me it's like You've taken away my power. Um, so I do like that, though I, I had trouble with the, the Cento poems, right, because I could not, I had to use the language that was already in the documents. So that was, that's a different thing. But I still tried to, like, organize the sentences in a way that still were, was representative of how I think about the world. Wow. And are you working on another project now? I wish that I was working on another project right now. But I do, actually, I have kind of started, like I've taken notes and watched a couple documentaries, and I know what it is. Um, I'm writing a, a novel based on a, a cult in Portland that was um, led by a black man. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, so I'm really excited because I get to create a voice, you know, like a voice that's, you know, biblical. But then also he was, like, from Watts, California, so he's also, like, streetwise. So I'm just, I'm really excited to kind of figure out what that sounds like. Wow. And I kind of switched subjects, but what are what are your thoughts about reparations, since that's now a really um, timely subject? If they were giving them out, I would be in line to get them. <laughs> I just can't. I think, uh, here, here's what I think. I think that if we give out reparations, and then we we keep the same systems in place to to keep people of color, or I guess in this case, black people, um, like excluded from the means of like uh, keeping the wealth. Exactly. Then it's like yeah. it's like winning the lottery. Exactly. You know, so like as long as the financial markets are set up as they are, us having a bunch of money wouldn't necessarily. You know, like, it would be great in the short term, but, like, it's not going to create generational wealth because I, I, there's a book. I didn't read the book, but I saw it on a book review, and it, the guy's basic premise was that um, that uh, the financial what, – what did he call it? What did he say? Uh, yeah, but the financial system or the financial markets and philanthropy were arms of white supremacy. Mm. And, like, they're basically saying that they were both – uh, they both keep maintain the status quo. Um, and so I really do think that, like, you could give us a bunch of money, but we, if we didn't have access to, like, the best schools and, you know, if we couldn't participate in the markets in the way that they do, then, or you know, even, a generation... even to have the... If you don't grow up in an, in an environment that knows how to deal with money, it can be very hard to learn that successfully yes. later. I've, I've seen this with some very very close friends yeah um, i think i'm learning it now <laughs> <laughs> yeah it can be very very challenging and so it's it's very likely that a large portion of people would will not would not be able to hang on to the money for very long and yeah. and that's common you know whenever there's a redistrib- redistribution of wealth for whatever reason it ends up getting concentrated again um, yeah, that's his. You know, look at history. You're going to find that. My fear is that if we, if if the U.S. government did these reparations, then that would be like an excuse. For, okay, the playing field's even now, so you know we're not. Yeah. You know we're not going to well, do anything else. And, it's kind of like the post Obama backlash, right? Like y'all yeah. had a black president, everything was good. Like now we can just yeah, take everything exactly, away. <laughs> exactly. I know. I know. So we're out of time, and it's been so much fun talking to you today, Mitchell. Yeah, it's been a blast. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, good good luck with your tour. I know you're just starting out, and you've got a yeah. lot of ways to go. 
and I want to recommend to all my listeners Survival Math Notes on an All-American Family. Mitchell quotes a very powerful speech by Frederick Douglass on manumission in the book, and since Caroline isn't here to provide our closing quote, here is a quote from Frederick Douglass that I think is very appropriate for this book. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. See you all next week on Writer's Voices.